We're, we're continuing, obviously, in, this, in our series in Leviticus. And uh, as we do this, we've been talking about something that I think is really important for us to understand. And I realize that a lot of times we approach the Bible, we approach the scriptures, maybe losing, or, or so, losing sight of what we're going to talk about right now. Um, sometimes we don't even have this perspective, and so the Bible is perceived as confusing or irrelevant, or sometimes we kind of see it as being this antiquated book, and we go, why is all this stuff here? Um, when you open up your Bible, and this is really good just to know in general, whenever you open a Bible and you start to read it, um, you are not reading a random collection of histories and poetries and prophecies and letters. And I think that sometimes is what people think. Sometimes people look at the Bible with all of its authors, they look at all the length of time with which it was gathered, and how it all came together. And there's sort of this assumption that, well, the Bible is sort of a random collection of sacred documents. If you, if you come to the Bible with that sort of approach, oftentimes it's not going to make sense to you. But when you understand this, when you understand that the Bible tells a story, when you understand that from the very first pages as you begin to read that it's trying to unpack a singular storyline, the Bible begins to take on a whole new understanding. See, the Bible, um, beginning in the book of Genesis, which is kind of the first book of the Old Testament, it's the book in which we discover this God of creation, this God who has a special people, all these different things. In the book of Genesis, we're introduced to a God who is unlike any other God before him. In fact, when the book of Genesis lands on the scene and and humanity begins to unpack this and see this, they've been living the way they've been living for centuries. Uh, In fact, people had been living towards gods in a very particular way. People worship the pantheon of gods. They had all sorts of religious practices trying to appease those gods. And that pantheon of gods was, um, was fickle. There were gods that were associated with the wind, gods associated with the elements like fire or rain. They were gods who would turn their back on you in a moment's notice. And it created sort of this erratic insecurity in humanity, always trying to find out whether or not God was for them or against them. And they thought somehow they could manipulate these gods into showing favor by behaving particular ways. When we're introduced to this God that we read about in Genesis, he's a completely different kind of God. We meet a God who is unlike other gods. He's unlike anything that people had known before. Um, Maybe you can identify with this, and maybe this will help you understand. Um, When you went to school, odds are that as you moved through your elementary years, as you moved into junior high or high school, or maybe even college, I hope it didn't take this long, but hopefully at some point in that journey, there was that teacher who was unlike any other teacher. Do you know what I'm talking about? Remember, there were teachers who were like every other teacher, right? There were teachers who know how to keep you in your seat and keep you from fidgeting, right? If you were like me, that was really important in school. Um, There were teachers who know how to get you to lunch in time. There were teachers who knew how to break up a fight. And there were teachers who were meaner than other teachers, but they were all just like teachers. Then there was that one teacher, right? There was that teacher. How many of you, if I asked you, you know, who's your favorite teacher, you could fill in the blank to that. Raise your hand. Because that teacher was unlike any other teacher you knew before, right? That teacher did things, said things, behaved in ways that you never saw. And so for some reason, that teacher stands out in your mind. That's what we meet with the God of Genesis. We meet a God who is unlike the other gods. This God does things differently. And specifically, the one thing that he is known for is this big idea. This is not a God who waits for people to come looking for him. This is a God who is in search of humanity. This is the God who comes to us. And this story of scripture is weaving brilliantly and beautifully through all of the pages and all of the stories, this bigger picture of a God who is in pursuit of us, a God who is unlike other gods. That's what we're seeing here. And what we also see is what this God is forming. So we have a God who is different, but then we also see a people who are not like other people. And these two stories run together. They run parallel. They weave in and out of each other. We have a God who is not like other gods, and then we have a people who are not like other people. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, what we mean by this is a dynamic that's taking place in the heart of a human. There's something that happens when humanity um, connects with the God of creation. There's something that happens when a human being, a human heart is grounded in God. There's something that takes place when a person understands the nearness of God's presence and they begin to live with this this sense of his nearness. There's something that happens when a person knows God, like when you know that amidst all of the intricacies and the unbelievable expanse of this universe, that there is a God who knows you 
you and you know him, there's something that happens inside of us. There's an aliveness that takes place when we connect with this God who has created us. That whole story is what brings us to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is the third book in the Old Testament, the third of five books that the the, the Jews call the Torah. It's a book that arrives at a very specific time for a very specific reason. Um, In fact, Leviticus comes to the human human hands shortly after the book of Genesis. And, And it's good for you to understand that Moses wrote Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus. And it was all about this God who was unlike other gods. It's all about these people who were unlike other people. And when Leviticus lands on the scene, it lands in the hands of the Hebrews who are just exiting 400 years of captivity in Egypt. So they've been slaves. They've been slaves and all they've ever known as slaves is the mythology of the Egyptians. They've seen people worship the way the Egyptians worship. They've only seen people live in culture the way the Egyptians have lived in culture. And now they know that there's something different about them, but what is it? They know that there's a God who's different, but who is he? And the story of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, is unpacking for them how they can live out the story that's being presented in scripture, they're learning how to be connected with their creator. How do you connect with the God who created you? And how do you live in community with one another? That's what this story is unpacking. And we, what we've been discovering, if you've been here the past couple of weeks, what you've been seeing is that somehow, like beneath this seemingly mundane information between, between the rites and the rituals of Leviticus, there is something beautiful and there's something compelling. And it's not just something that, that a bunch of people wandering in the desert a few thousand years ago needed. It's actually something that speaks life and power today for a group of people who were learning about a God who was unlike other gods, who are desiring to be a people who were unlike other people. So it applies to us. And so today we get to Leviticus chapter 3. So week 1 was Leviticus 1, week 2, Leviticus 2, week 3, Leviticus 3. Some of you right now are already thinking to yourself, maybe there's 27 books in Leviticus and this is going to be a long series, right? (laughs) Some of you are relieved because I've been joking about a 52-week series. And so you're like, oh, right, we're only going to do 27 weeks. Good. And some of you just decided to not come back next week. We're not doing 27 weeks. I'm not going to tell you how long we're going to be here. But, uh, but, but chapter 3 is where we are today. So we're in chapter 3. But in order to get to chapter 3 and for it to make sense, we really do need to recap what happened in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. So even if you were here, I just need to remind you. And if you weren't here, you're going to get a small glimpse of some of the crazy stuff we talked about the past couple of weeks. So we're going to wade through some deep weeds for a minute. I just need you to hang with me as we do this because it's brilliant when you see how God, you will see how brilliant God is when you see how all of this is fitting together. So back to Leviticus chapter 1, just for a moment, just to refresh our memories, reframe the conversation. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 1 says this, the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting saying this, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, and that word offering is key, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock, and then he continues on with a bunch of details. That word offering was the critical word of the first week. We realize that that word in the Hebrew language literally means to come near to God, to come near to him. So if any of you wishes to come near to me. So what we get in the very beginning, chapter one, Leviticus one, is this idea. If you want to be near to God, here is how you do it. And what we see through chapter one is this beautiful thing presented to us that has a very complicated word called atonement. Atonement, another way we might say that is at one mint. It's this idea of things being reconciled. It's this idea of things being put back together. At one moment, atonement is this idea that encapsulates us being united and reconciled with someone. So here was the idea. Here's what we saw in chapter one. We saw that a person would have this animal from their herd or from their flock or from their birds, whatever, whatever they brought, and they would bring it to this altar. And then at that place, they would lay their hands. They would lean on the lamb, and they would confess, they would talk about, they would think about their brokenness. And in this very physical act, there was this sacrifice that was made. And as these people were acknowledging their brokenness, the animal was slayed on the, on the altar. And in the, that process, we learn what atonement is. It is this covering. It is this idea that the animal is getting what you deserved. So you can be forgiven. 
God says, listen, now I see you differently because of this moment where you are leaning on the lamb. That's the story of Leviticus chapter 1. Um, if you're taking notes this morning, and, and this is probably a, a good one to take, this is something to maybe even memorize about the book of Leviticus. If you want to understand chapter 1, what's the summary statement? Leviticus chapter 1 is this. You are forgiven. It's the whole point of the whole thing. The whole point of the entire chapter is God being able to look at you and say, you're forgiven. And for you to be able to look at God and say, I'm forgiven. That's the point of it. So that's chapter one. Chapter two, last week was the grain offering. And we looked last week at all the ingredients that are involved in the grain offering. We looked at all the details and how God's weaved all these intricacies into this particular minha sacrifice. And what we discovered is that the minha, as you brought the minha, the grain offering, it was, it was a, a statement that you were making. It was an act of submission. You were saying, God, you are God and I am not. It was this way of a person saying, I'm living my life in submission to the reality that I now know to be true, that you are the God of the universe and I am a part of your creation and I'm going to live subject to you. The minha was this submitting to God. It was a surrendering to God. That was the whole point. So chapter one, you're forgiven. Chapter two, you surrender. So you're forgiven and you surrender. God does something and you respond. That's the story of chapter one and chapter two. And it's a very natural response. This is a natural thing to happen with any relationship, right? So you think about anybody in your life. You could, this could be like a marital relationship, a boyfriend, girlfriend thing, could just be friends that you're friends with, could be like anybody. If there's a person in your life and somebody does something that is overtly gracious for you, Somebody does something that's just super nice. Somebody goes above and beyond. Is there not something that stirs in your heart towards that person when they do it? You know what I'm talking about? Are you with me on this? Like somebody does something nice and you're like, man, I trust them a little bit more than I trusted them before this. Like somebody does something kind and you go, man, that person has my best interest at heart. And there's something that begins to change in you because of what that person does for you. That's what's being described here. Chapter one, you're forgiven. Chapter two, you surrender. So I want you to look at some details with me. Now I want you to notice in chapter one, verse two, when these sacrifices, when these drawing near practices begin, there's a word that gets used and it gets word used in chapter two as well with the second sacrifice. He says this in verse one. He says, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, and anyone know what the next word is? When, when you do this, the words when, okay? So move to chapter two, the first word of chapter two with the grain offering, second sacrifice, the first word of chapter two is when, when you do this. Now I want you to look at chapter three, what we're looking at today, verse one, what's the first word? If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering. If he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. All of the rest of that sounds similar to the last two weeks, doesn't it? But the first word is different, which should tell us something. If God's word is perfect, if it's inspired, there's a fairly good chance that there's some meaning in this, right? That's what we're seeing in the book of Leviticus. What's going on with the word when? Well, when somebody says when, it means there's an expectation that goes with that, right? So if I said to you, hey, when I go to the store later today, what does that mean? It assumes I'm going to the store, right? So I say when I'm going to the store, it assumes that that's going to be happening. So in, in one sense, we have when. When you do this, when you do that. Chapter one, chapter two, when. When you come near to me, the assumption is you're going to come near to me. When you commit your life to me, it assumes that you're going to commit your life. It assumes that you're going to come into a moment of surrender to God. It's assuming that this is a rhythm that is going to be a part of every human's life when you draw near, when you commit. But then we get to chapter three, and it says, if, if. So if, if when assumes something is going to happen, what does if mean? Is this something that God is commanding? It isn't, is it? This is really important because as you move through Leviticus, we see the importance of this single realization. When we study chapter 3, the context of chapter 3 is not like to come near to me, you need to do this. 
That's the context for chapter one. That's the context for chapter two. This is not something that you need to do for the forgiveness of your sins or the reconciliation of relationship. God's saying, listen, if you do this, like this is up to you. This is not mandatory. This is something you do out of your own free will. And what's interesting about that is throughout the Old Testament, you see this particular sacrifice referred to as free will offerings, which means this is something you get to decide to do. This is something you can do if you happen to have the means. This is not something that God is demanding of you. This is a peace offering. It's different. It's different. The word that's translated peace from Hebrew into English, in some Bibles, it's the word fellowship. It's that strange Christian word that only Christians use that no one else understands what it is. What is fellowship? Like, we're going to get together in fellowship. What is that? Well, if, if you're not a church person, I apologize for every Christian that's ever said fellowship to you because you're like, that's creepy, whatever fellowship <laughs> is, right? But the Hebrew word that's translated here is the Hebrew word salem. Salem. Does it sound like another Hebrew word? Shalom, Right? It sounds like shalom. Shalom is this word that encompasses flourishing. Shalom is this word that that talks about all of humanity living the way they were intended to live. The Hebrews, ancient and modern, when they greet each other, when they see each other in the street, do you know what they say to each other? Shalom. Turn to somebody and say shalom to somebody next to you, right? (laughs) Right? So they would do this. They would live. They would walk in the streets and they would, hey, like, shalom, brother. Like, that was their thing. Like, shalom, you know. Shalom, my sister. That's what they did. It was shalom, you know. And it was this greeting. It was this blessing. And when you said it to another person, what you were doing was engaging them in a new sort of community like this. We're we're a people who are different. We're a people who live towards each other in a different sort of way. And I want what's best for you. And you want what's best for me. I shalom you. And you shalom me. It's this idea of peace and wholeness and well-being. So that's what's going on here. This is a peace offering, and it is up to you whether or not you want to do this. So verse 1 says this, If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And by the way, as you move through chapter 3, you will see no mention of atonement or or the forgiveness of sins. You won't see any of that in chapter 3. Go on to verse 2. It says, And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. And if you haven't been here the past two weeks, this is what we've been living with. There's been lots of blood being flung all over the place, and you just kind of have to live with it to get through Leviticus. Verse 3 says, And from the sacrifice of the peace offering, as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that's on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver. Don't forget that. That he shall remove with the kidneys. I know some of you right now, like the smell of formaldehyde in your high school biology class, it's all... (laughs) coming back, right? You just, the little parts, separate them out with a little pig. It's so sad, right? (laughs) If anyone gets up right now, I get it, okay? I understand. (laughs) I might. But here's what's interesting about this, and this is what I want you to see. Notice the precision. We're cutting out all these different parts. But here's what's interesting. You only burn part of the animal. So let's go back to chapter 1, verse 9. Chapter 1, verse 9 says this, you're to wash the internal organs and the legs, this is the burnt offering, wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn what of it? All of it, right? It's a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. We've been saying that God loves the smell of a good barbecue, right? All of it. Why all of it? Well, remember the context of chapter 1. Chapter 1, what are we talking about? Chapter 1, we're talking about the forgiveness of, of sins. We're talking about the wiping away of our brokenness. And don't you want all of that taken care of? Right? Like, I've never, like, no one anywhere has ever said, you know, God, I'd like for you to forgive, like, a portion of my sins today, but that latent guilt of shame and and, and, that latent sense of guilt and shame, I'd like that for a little while. Like, could I just live in that place? We don't say that, right? We want all, all of our sins forgiven. We want all of our brokenness forgiven. But in chapter 3, We have the fat, we have the kidneys, we have the long lobe of the liver, we have all of these parts that are being carved out. And it seems a little strange, 
And what we're discovering in Leviticus is this, that oftentimes the more strange it is, the more symbolic it is, and the more depth there may be behind this. So what's going on with the details and the portions that are being cut out? Now you remember, if you were here the first couple of weeks, that meat is incredibly precious, right? Meat is this valuable, rare commodity Among the categories of meat, the thing that is even more of a delicacy, the thing that people value even greater is fat. Unbelievably, like fat is is this delicacy that only people that had incredible wealth, I think it's like why we love bacon today. We love fat, right? It's this delicacy. And only the wealthy could enjoy this delicacy. Why? Because only rich people had enough money to feed their animals enough to get fat, right? Right? Everybody else had scrawny sheep and scrawny cows, but the wealthy, they had these well-fed, fat cows and sheep. And so this became a symbol of wealth. It became a symbol of prosperity and of blessing. By the way, do you remember when the prodigal son came home and the father sent the servants out? What did they slaughter? What did they bring back? The fattened calf, right? The father was blessed and he was blessing. So fattened is symbolic of God's blessing and his best. Which, by the way, for those of us going into the holidays now, this is really good news, right? Because some of us will look more blessed in a few months than others, right? Like, God, thank you for your word. This is when I love his words. Like, God, thank you, because I'm blessed, right? So the fat is the best, and God says, give it to me. I want you to give me the best. So, so When you come with a peace offering, come with the best. Why? Because I want to know that you and I are tight. I want to know that you take this thing seriously. Your earnestness is made evident in what you bring to the altar, and I want you to bring your best. So you give the fat. Then you move on to the entrails, right? The kidneys, the long lobe of the liver. Why is that? What's going on here? So you give your best, but then there's this stuff. Throughout the Bible and throughout Hebrew culture, what we see is that in the Hebrew consciousness, there was this understanding that the entrails of a human being, the liver, the guts, the things that are the deepest in you, they are synonymous with what we translate into English as the heart. The heart. So these things literally are associated with the heart. They are the innermost organs. They are way deep down inside of a person. They were seen by the Hebrews as the seat of emotions. Now, were they really saying that your emotions are located in your liver? Well, they weren't great at biology yet at that point, but that's not exactly what they were saying. Have you ever been in a circumstance and there was something that sort of welled up in your gut and you knew that you probably needed to change direction? Have you ever heard somebody say, I just made a gut decision? Or have you ever felt something in your gut? How many of you have ever felt something in your gut? You just got this feeling, you got this sense that maybe we ought to change course, or maybe I ought to do this, or maybe I should make this decision. I've got a gut feeling about it. That's the picture being painted in this. We're talking about deep down. We're talking about the innermost part of a person. And what is God saying? He's saying, I want your heart. I want your gut. I want your deepest feelings. I want your inmost feelings. I want you, when you come to me, to come with this sincerity. I want you to come with this authentic yearning. I want there to be something that's just driving from inside of you that says, I want to know who this God is. So the question is this. God asked for this. He asked for these things to be piled up and burnt on on this altar. The question then is, what happens with the rest of it? These are the questions I ask at least, right? So you burn this stuff, and that's the peace offering, but what do you do with the rest of the meat? Because remember, meat is a delicacy. So what do you do with it? If you have a Bible, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12, and if you don't, don't worry, we'll follow on the screen. You can just go there with me. But Deuteronomy chapter 12 answers this question. What do you do with the meat? Now, the context for Deuteronomy is very similar to the context for Leviticus. Remember, Leviticus, we're being presented with a God who is not like other gods, and he's shaping a people who are not like other people. And in Deuteronomy, the first verse we're going to read, verse 4, is actually a reference to this. God's saying, listen, I don't want you to be like other people. I want you to do some things differently, and this is what it says. Verse 4 says, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Like, don't be like the, the primitive people who are living around you. Worship God this way. You shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your, listen to this, 
You shall go to this place and you should bring your burnt offerings, Leviticus chapter one, and your sacrifices, your tithes, and the contribution that you present, Leviticus chapter two, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, Leviticus chapter three, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. Do you see this? So when, when you bring Leviticus chapter three to me, that's the instructions. When you bring, so you bring Leviticus one, you bring Leviticus two, and then when you bring your free will offerings, verse seven says this about your free will offerings. There you shall eat before the Lord your God. What do you do with the rest of the meat? You eat it. You shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake in which the Lord has blessed you. You're going to eat out of all the goodness that God's given you. You're going to have a meal together. Now flip over to to chapter 16. Chapter 16 of Deuteronomy says this. (coughs) Excuse me. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering, this is Leviticus chapter three, from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. Listen to this, listen to who you're rejoicing with. You, your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite or the priest who is within your towns. In other words, Take your pastor to lunch every now and then. That's what he's saying. The sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell. I want you to listen to what's happening here. You bring the sacrifice. With what's left, you have a meal. And at that meal, you invite some people to join you. And who who joins you there? Well, your son, that makes sense. Your daughter, that makes sense. Your male and female servants, that makes sense because they live in your house and you guys spend a lot of time together. But then it starts to stray, right? Then you bring this pastor friend of yours that lives down the street, right? And again, I'm not going to shame you for doing that. And I'm not going to, you can invite me to ribs if you want to serve up ribs or something like that. I'll, I'll take it. And then it goes even further and he says the sojourner. And I know you go, okay, what's a sojourner? I know maybe some of you church people go, oh, I've heard that before. Sojourner literally means the stranger, The stranger in the strangest sense. He's talking about the person who grew up on the other side of the tracks. He's talking about a person who culturally is not like you. They don't speak your language. They don't listen to your music. They don't vote like you do. They don't think like you do. They don't live by the same cultural customs that you do. You invite the sojourner, the stranger who's passing by. You invite the widow and the fatherless. You invite the woman who's lost her husband You invite the child who is living without their mom and dad. That is who you invite to this table. And you start to get a sense that maybe God has a heart for those whom life has dealt a difficult blow. Amen? So God says, if, if you'd like to do this, not when like chapter one, not when like chapter two, but if you would like to do this, If, what does this mean? He's saying this. If, because of the joy of being forgiven, Leviticus chapter one. If, because you've given your life to God, Leviticus chapter two. If those things have taken place, then come to the temple with a pure heart and make an offering to God and then have a meal and invite all these people with you and celebrate the goodness of of who I am in their midst. That's what he's saying. I want you to invite these people to your table. When you have been forgiven, when you have submitted your life to me, and then you celebrate, I want you to celebrate by inviting everybody to the table. I want there to be shalom in your world because of me and what I've done. I want you to look at what I've given you, what I've done for you, and share that with them. It's even more fascinating as you see this repeated throughout scripture. In 1 Kings chapter 8, in Deuteronomy, there's this allusion to God locating himself in a temple. There was this idea that the people of Israel would build a temple, a place where people could come, gather, and listen for the voice of God, interact with him, and know his presence. That happens. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, um, Solomon, King Solomon, has built a temple, and there's this dedication ceremony, like the ribbon cutting, you know? They're going to open the thing up, grand opening. And, uh, and at this grand opening, listen to what Solomon does in 1 Kings 8, verse 64. It says, The same day the king consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered, now check this out, the burnt offering, Leviticus 1, 
the grain offering, Leviticus 2, and the fat pieces of the peace offering, Leviticus chapter 3. Leviticus 1, Leviticus 2, Leviticus 3. Solomon is following the order of Leviticus, isn't he? Why does God prescribe it this way? And could it be that the God of the universe who created this world ex nihilo, out of nothing, could it be that the God who has brought order to the chaos has something for us in the order of Leviticus 1, 2, and 3? Go back to verse 5 of Leviticus chapter 3. That's where we left off in verse 4. Listen to this. It says, Then Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar. And listen to where he burns it. On top of the burnt offering. So when this happens, there's already been a burnt offering. When you offer this peace offering, this fellowship offering, the burnt offering has already happened. It's already taken place, and it's offered on top of it. Now remember, this is a peace offering, and there are these specific explanations. You're celebrating in a very particular way, and now I want you to think about this for a minute. The idea behind chapter 3 is this if If you are celebrating your peace with God, if you're celebrating your fellowship with God, if you're celebrating the fact that you and God have been reconciled, this is what you do. But why have you been reconciled? Because of chapter one, because of chapter two, because you've been forgiven and you have committed your life to him. There's this picture. The peace offering comes only when you understand what God has already done for you, when you've experienced his grace, when you've experienced his forgiveness, when when, when you've found yourself in awe of who he is and you're living in submission to him. Only then and on top of that do you offer this peace offering. So you picture a person on a nice fall day who's just made this offering and they are so aware of who they are in the eyes of God. They understand that they've been forgiven and they throw this feast and they get the biggest table they've ever had and the most meat they've ever served and they invite everybody over for dinner. And you know what they talk about? God and I are good. God and I are tight and I have received this blessing and he serves out of all the goodness and all of the blessing that he has been bestowed. They throw a loud party. They rejoice. That's literally the instruction. I want you to rejoice. Which, by the way, in the church in America, rejoice is something like this. Hallelujah. (laughs) Right? You realize there's a decibel dynamic to the word rejoice. There is a volume dynamic to it. The word rejoice literally means that there would be a party so loud, your neighbors call the cops on you. That's what it means. Like, it's so loud. People hear you partying. That's what we're talking about. When you and I understand the overflowing grace and mercy of God, when we have been forgiven at that level and we see who God is, there is something that flows out of us. There's this appreciation. There's a party that happens and we celebrate. God has forgiven you, Leviticus 1. You have lived in submission to him, Leviticus 2. That's what takes place. And here's what we see happening. You can't have a party until you've been forgiven. The purpose of the party is to celebrate your peace with God. So no peace, no party, right? And the order of this is all on purpose, and now's when you get to see where this thing starts fleshing itself out. You can only have peace and joy with others at the table when you have peace and joy with God. Do you see where this is going? When you have peace and joy with God, suddenly you can sit at a table with people you never dreamed you'd sit with. Isn't this a beautiful picture? This is a new kind of community. As you experience this, God is forming something around you like this Something is happening, and now we have a God like we've never known and a people like we've never seen. Here's the problem with this. I think this is beautiful and it's compelling, and it really is an amazing thing. Like, I think about it, I go, man, I, man, I just want to see people live this way. I want to see this lived out, but I've discovered something. I don't get along with everybody. <laughs> Anyone else with me in this? Can you identify? Like, anybody like, not get along with everybody they meet? Right? Like, Is there anybody in the room that doesn't have somebody somewhere that the way they say things, the way they live their life, the way they do things, it's like their life is like proverbial fingernails on the chalkboard around you. 
You know, they just drive you nuts at every turn. You're like, ah, oh, like you just, they'll never seem to go away. By the way, um, we all have these people. I have these people in my life and you're not in here. Um, those people were in the last service, <laughs> not in this service. But right, there's somebody somewhere that has a way of just driving you crazy, right? And, and, and we realize this. Like, we realize, like, this thing that's being described is beautiful. But at some point, you come to realize people aren't perfect. And it's people's lack of perfection that keeps getting in my way, right? Like, I'm getting pretty annoyed with people's lack of perfection. And life would be a lot easier if the people around me were perfect. Amen? Amen? Yeah, I'm being sarcastic. Those of you that don't know what sarcasm is, that's sarcastic, right? But it's true, right? A lack of perfection gets in the way. In fact, um, the psalmist in Psalm 14 said this. He said, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They all have turned aside. Together they become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. It's kind of a bleak picture, but we get the point. We're flawed, right? Humanity's flawed. There's nobody who's perfect. Yes, we have a tremendous capacity to bring flourishing and shalom and peace. We can do amazing, beautiful things with our hands and our minds and our strength. But at the same time, on the flip side, we have the same capacity to bring disintegration and destruction and devastation to lives and finances and and all sorts of things, right? We have this capacity. It's why in Romans 3, the apostle Paul in verse 23 said these iconic words. He said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, all of us are broken. Every person in this room is flawed. We're all imperfect. And my problem is, and I can't speak for the rest of you, but my problem is this. When I hang around other people, even people I hold in high regard, eventually I see something that isn't perfect. I see their flaws and I get disappointed in them. I lose respect for them. Eventually, I see something that I'd rather not see. How many of you have ever been let down by somebody you looked up to? How many of you know what it's like to have somebody you held in high regard only to have them say something, do something, or act in a particular way, and you realize they're just as flawed as you are? See, that's what happens. That's what takes place. And the Bible teaches pretty clearly that we're not perfect, we're not perfect, which means that like, when you get to know me, guess what? I'm going to let you down big time. I'm going to let you down. I'm going I'm to say something or I'm not going to say something or I'm going to do something or I'm not going to not do something. And either one of those, you're going to be let down. You're going to be disappointed with me. Um, I can tell you, like my daughters as a dad, I guarantee I've let them down as their dad. I can tell you that in my marriage, I've let my, da- my wife down as, as a husband. I've let people down as a pastor. I've let friends down. I've done things and I've shown my brokenness. I am going to let people down. And here's the deal. When I get to know you, guess what I'm going to discover? You're going to let me down. That's what it means to be human because I'm flawed and you're flawed. I'm broken and you're broken. All of us are imperfect. So God is creating this new kind of people and we see this beautiful picture. We see people at a table that would never be at a table together. But then we have to ask ourselves, how does this ever happen? How do we get past our petty differences and our annoyances with one another? How do we build these sort of intimate, peaceful, beautiful relationships with others? How does this happen without us constantly butting up against our differences and our brokenness? How do you have a meal at a table like that with so many broken people? This is a question that for me lately, it's been rolling around as I watch the the racial issues that exist in our culture today. And I'll just tell you, my heart is broken as I watch the battle of racism and prejudice and I see the things that people say and the the need to reconcile. It's this thing that, it just, I ache. I ache for some sort of resolution. When I look at the division in our political system, in our nation, I see the things that people say and I hear the stuff that comes out of their mouths and just the fighting and the brokenness and the divisions. There's this thing inside of me that goes, how, how in the world are we ever going to sit down at a table together? How does this happen? And here's what I've been learning, and here's what Leviticus has been showing me. It only happens when you change the heart of a human being. The only way this reconciliation ever happens is through the change of a human heart. The Apostle Paul writes this in Colossians chapter 1. He says, You, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. 
There's a key phrase in this that I think helps us understand how we begin this journey of being this kind of people. He says that you're holy and blameless before him. Some of your Bibles might say holy and blameless in his sight. Here's my problem. Here's my issue. My problem is that when I look at you, I look at you with my sight. I look at you with my eyes. And when I do, I see a flawed, sinful human being the same way you see me that way. When I see you, I see you with my sight. But God says this. He says, when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for you, he says, when now when I look at you, I don't see all that you're lacking. I don't see your brokenness. I don't see your frailty. I see my son. I see you forgiven and perfect. And that's good news, isn't it? And the key phrase is, in his sight. And what I'm learning to do and what he's challenging us to learn to do is to see people in God's sight, to see people as God sees them, so that when I walk alongside of you or or live life with you or dine with you at a table, that I would see you as God sees you, that I would see you without blemish, that I would see you free of accusation, that I would see you as God sees you, and that is loved. That's the challenge. If God likes what he sees, maybe I should too, right? I should be able to see you the way God sees you. And if there's no peace, there's no party. Remember this? So this Hebrew word for offering is drawn near. And in verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 2, it says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, the Apostle Paul appealing to the language of Leviticus. You've been brought near. And then in verse 14, he says, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And the answer for peace is not in me and it's not in you because we're messed up. The answer to peace is found in Jesus. He is the peace. And that is exactly what we're being told in Leviticus. You would not have the peace offering, the peace celebration, until you had the sacrifice. You can't have Leviticus 3 until you've had Leviticus 1 and Leviticus 2. You can't have the peace without the sacrifice. You offer that offering on top of the other one. So this is a God who is unlike any other God and he wants us to be people unlike any other people. And do you realize how radical that claim is? Do you realize how significant this? Like, think about the topics that are dividing people today. Think about the issues that are in our culture that are, that are devastating when we consider them. Do you realize how radical this is? Think about the people in your life that I was mentioning earlier that just drive you crazy. Think about those people and, and taking this and applying it. Think about what would happen when you begin to see them as Jesus sees them. How does that happen? How do we begin to live towards others that way? Leviticus 1, Leviticus 2, Leviticus 3. That you yourself understand the sacrifice, that you lean on the lamb, that you live in submission to God. Leviticus chapter 2, you understand that he's God and you're not. And then Leviticus 3 You party and celebrate and invite everyone to join you and tell the story of your brokenness and your forgiveness. Amen? Isn't it a beautiful picture? Would you stand with me? May you live in Leviticus 1 with a deep sense of forgiveness. May you submit to Jesus like Leviticus 2 and may you bring flourishing and shalom like Leviticus 3. Amen? Amen. Amen. Love you guys so much. Thanks for being here today. We'll see you guys next Sunday. See you later.